And please, brothers and sisters, turn with me in your copies of God's Word to this same psalm, Psalm 109. Um, we'll be looking at the whole of this psalm. It is found on page 619 in the Bible's provided, Psalm 109. And it's intentional that we're both singing it and hearing it because there's a lot to pay attention to in this psalm. And I expect this is probably one that we're, we're not as familiar with. I, I know we, it's, not, it's not one that comes up in the psalm sings very often. These are hard words. Yeah, this is God's word. And so let's hear him. Uh, psalm 109. I'll be reading the whole of this psalm. Uh, I do want to remind you that uh, last week uh, I was introducing how there are voices of the wicked in the psalms. And this one is uh, related to that uh, sermon from last week. And that this is, I would say, the most extended time that we hear uh, the voices of the wicked as well. So here, here now, God's holy and inerrant word, Psalm 109. To the choir master, a psalm of David. Be not silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. Appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children wander about and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. May the creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor any pity to his fatherless children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be plotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. And let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. For he did not remember to show kindness, but pursued the poor and needy and the brokenhearted to put them to death. He loved to curse, let curses come upon him. He did not delight in blessing. May it be far from him. He clothed himself with cursing as his coat. May it soak into his body like water, like oil into his bones. May it be like a garment that he wraps around him, like a belt that he puts on every day. May this be the reward of my accusers from the Lord, of those who speak evil against my life. But you, O Lord my God, O oh God, my Lord, deal on my behalf for your name's sake. Because your steadfast love is good, deliver me, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is stricken within me. I am gone like a shadow at evening. I am shaken off like a locust. My knees are weak through fasting. My, my body has become gaunt with no fat. I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they wag their heads. Help me. O oh Lord, my God, save me according to your steadfast love. Let them know that this is your hand. You, O oh Lord, have done it. Let them curse, but you will bless. They arise and are put to shame, but your servant will be glad. May my accusers be clothed with dishonor. May they be wrapped in their own shame as in a cloak. With my mouth, I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng, for he stands at the right hand of the needy to save him from those who condemn his soul to death. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we are needful of your Holy Spirit. 
We are needful of you, Lord Jesus, to speak from heaven your, this, your word. Give us understanding. Lord, give us a right fear. Lord, fill us with love for you. Protect us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Whose line is this? My sons were recently actors in a short play, and they did a great job. But back when the group began to practice, it was discovered that in the script there were some errors. Some of the lines had the wrong character speaking them. There were also some other changes that were necessary in light of the cast, uh, who is cast to which character, which only added confusion at times. All that to say, it can be extremely hard to follow what is going on when it is unclear who is speaking. Well, I would put to, forward to you this evening that the 109th Psalm has brought on similar confusion. Not, and absolutely not, because there is any error in the script. There's not. This is God's word. But I think there are and have been differences of interpretation of who is speaking to whom. Who is saying what? Which leads to very different assessments of what, what to even make of this psalm. With that as an, our introduction, I think it should be clear that there is a lot for us to talk about this evening. And I won't be able to give detail to all of this. But I think the main message should be clear, that we should call upon the God of justice. And so let us call upon the God of justice. Now first, uh, in the first five verses, uh, we find maybe not a question, but a problem. The psalmist has the problem of who is speaking and who is not. The first five verses of this psalm orient us to what is going on. Uh, there is the psalmist who is suffering against, uh, against several evil mouths and tongues. They're plural, mouths and tongues. And the psalmist is laying out the situation. They encircle me with words of hate. They attack me. They accuse me. They're, they're giving evil and hatred. It is a battle of words. And the heart of the psalmist's petition is right there in verse 1. He's surrounded by the words of the wicked, and God appears silent. Be not silent. God, why are you not speaking? And we also get the psalmist's character in these opening verses. Verse 1, the psalmist wants God to speak because he wants to praise God. He says, God of my praise. It is not only their cacophony, but God's apparent aloofness that hinders him from praising God as he knows he, he, he desires to. And we also see that the psalmist is not the cause of the malice against him. This is important. Verse 4 and 5 especially, I show them love. I give myself to prayer. I do them good, verse 4. But they respond with hate. They attack, verse 3, without a cause. The psalmist is an innocent sufferer. He is blameless. He's done nothing to deserve their response. You could cross-reference another imprecatory psalm. And by the way, imprecatory just means a psalm that has cursing involved in it. Psalm 35, verses 13 and 14, uh, similarly have this, uh, this, this attitude towards the wicked, uh, these accusers saying, but I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. As one who laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. That is that the psalmist is saying, I have a specific care even for these who are against me. This is as I, I'm, I've treated them as a friend. The psalmist is saying, I, I truly did these people good. I cared for them, which makes their words all the more of a betrayal to me. Now, who? Who is speaking this opening prayer? In the inscription, we have it. It is a psalm of David. 
Uh, perhaps this arose from the many times David was hated and pursued by Saul, even though David had time and again spared his life, uh, was, was best friend to his son, and we later mourn at his death. Or perhaps this is David as he's fleeing Jerusalem, having, ha- having a, a son of Saul uh, curse him, openly curse him as he's fleeing for his life. Of course, we've seen throughout this series on the Psalms, haven't we, that David as anointed king is in the Psalms more than David. Jesus could surely say these opening verses. For our Lord Jesus was truly one who loved his enemies, even though he was hated by the Pharisees, and even as Judas secretly betrayed him. And I want to point out to you that Jesus himself makes this connection. Two two New Testament passages I want you to know connecting this psalm to Christ. The first, Christ himself making the connection. John chapter 15, uh, as he's saying, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before you. As he's saying, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Uh, Jesus is saying that because he's come and spoken to them and done the works that he's done among them, that if he he hadn't done, they they would not be guilty of sin. But as he has done it, they're not merely guilty of this sin against him. But they've shown that they hated not only him, but his father, whom they did not know. And then he connects to this psalm. He says, but the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. So John chapter 15 and also Matthew. Matthew in his gospel will connect verse 25 of this psalm with Jesus hanging from the cross. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. This is the very image, imagery of our Lord at the crucifixion. And so, friends, we should begin by seeing Jesus in this psalm. Jesus was hounded by the accusing words of the Pharisees and Sadducees and chief priests and scribes, and yet Jesus earnestly wanted to praise the Father. Jesus was righteous, loving his enemies. And yet there were times that the Father was silent to him. Perhaps this was what gave him such intensity as Jesus was praying in Gethsemane when he, when he sweated those great drops of blood. Father, why are you not, per, not speaking to me even as this psalm opens? Be not silent. A friend, if you, if you have had times when you, you're crying out to God, you are greatly and sorely afflicted, and you find God is not speaking, know that Jesus had suffered sim- similarly. If you find that you are being hounded by people that you, you can't think of the thing that you've done against them, See Jesus, who has experienced this far greater and far worse than you or I. And he did this as our pioneer, as our advocate, and indeed for our salvation. But friends, seeing that Jesus is so so clearly uh, spoken of and connected in the New Testament with this psalm presents a challenge for many who uh, see the series of words which immediately follow. And in reading these words, many ask the question, who is cursing? Who is cursing? Verse 6, appoint a wicked man to accuse him. Uh, the, an accuser to accuse him, that, that, that is the word Satan. Appoint a Satan against this man. May his children be fatherless, verse 9. How? Left to wander and beg in living ruins, This is a curse not only upon him, but upon his children after him. Verse 12, with none to pity them. Cut off. Blotted out. Let another take his office. These words are hard to read. To say little of how hard they are for us to sing. Or to know how to pray. Indeed, there are some authors who have taken the position that these curses are barbaric, sinful, devilish, and that they must always and only be a warning to our hearts. But here's the problem. I've already pointed out from Matthew and from John how even Jesus himself identified with this psalm, but we also see in Acts chapter 1. Acts 1, verse 20, one of these particular curses, right in this section, there is a stream of curses. Verse 8, let another take his office, is quoted by the apostles and used by them as their guide for why Jesus wants them to replace Judas with another apostle. It would seem that the authoritative 
apostolic interpretation is saying that even these curses in this section, at least this one, is Jesus' words. But how could that be? Jesus told us to love our enemies and to pray for our persecutors. And absolutely, we, we, we know that Jesus was no hypocrite. Jesus was perfectly, and is perfectly righteous, perfectly fulfilled what is good. Jesus said, even from the cross, Father, forgive them. Or even in the context of this psalm, how could this psalmist, we might ask, which, who we've already identified and see so clearly showing Jesus, who is doing them good, who prays for them, how could he also use these curses? That's the chief question before us in interpretation of this psalm. How do we know who is saying what in this psalm? Or we might ask, in any of the psalms? Well, the answer is pronouns and context. <laughs> turn with me to Song of Solomon. Yes, yes, turn with me. Uh, I, I know we're, 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 we're studying a psalm that has cursing in it. I'm telling you to turn to a book of the Bible that many associate with, with love. And, uh, and I think that's going to be very helpful to us. Turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 1, because this is helpful to interpret not only this psalm, but many of the psalms that have multiple characters in them. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, by the way, is found on page 678 in the Pew Bibles. After verse 1, the introduction, notice the footnotes, if you're using the, the Pew Bibles. Verse 2 has a footnote that says, Bride. Or if, you, or if you're using the ESV, this is even more clear if you're reading through it because it has a, sh a heading right there, uh, bold, uh, throughout the text. Here it says, she. This is basically showing that this, this passage of the Bible is a script. There are characters who are saying each of these verses. And this, by the way, is not an invention of the interpreters. This arises from the text itself because whoever is speaking in verses 2, 3, and 4 is, re is referring to herself as me. And, and it's hard to tell in the English, but in the Hebrew, it's obvious that, that the you she's talking to, to is a masculine you. It's a, it's a woman speaking to a man. And yet the speaker changes. In verse 4, it's, it's either footnoted as the chorus or it's marked in it as a heading in your Bible as others. Uh, the, the pronouns switch. It goes from an I to a we. Well, who, who are these people? <laughs> did, did this person suddenly get multiple personality disorder? No. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, uh, the, bi the bride was gonna speak is going to speak again in verse 5. And she says, O daughters of Jerusalem. She tells us who it is from the context. She tells them, verse 6, do not stare or gaze at me. But then the man speaks up in verse 8. That is, we have these different characters that we know about because of the changes in the pronouns of the poetry itself and from the context of what is being said from one to another or about each of the parties. All that to show the pronouns and context identify the characters. Now, I, I know pronouns are a thing people in our culture mess around with today. I, 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 I want to say that if, if pronouns become confused, then beautiful literature like this does become unintelligible. This, this, is, this is important because it, it's, for, it's, it's clear for, it, this is important for communication. And so let's come back to Psalm 109 and look at the pronouns. Verses 1 through 5 have introduced the characters for us. You have the psalmist who is an innocent sufferer, the Lord, and you have them. All these people who are hating, accusing, speaking evil. It's me versus them in verses 1 through 5. Notice, though, that the pronouns switch in verse 6. Instead of him speaking about them, it is someone or someones speaking about him. And that goes on for many verses. It goes on and on. Even though it does sometimes speak of them, it speaks of their parents or their children. Or, or sorry, his parents or his children. This them speaking of, about him goes on all the way until verse 20. It is in verse 20 that it switches back. May this be the reward of my accusers. They're returning for the rest of this psalm back to me versus them. And so it would seem then that verses 6 through 19 are not the words of the psalmist, or at least not originally, but the words of his accusers, the words of these deceitful mouths opened against him. And, and that fits with the very verses that introduce this psalm, doesn't it? 
he described them as, verse 3, encircling me with words of hate. And indeed, these verses in this large section do drip with hatred. He described them as accusing me, verse 4. And so, verse 6, they cry for an accuser. They cry for a Satan to be appointed against him. Or verses 16 and 17 and 18 are specific accusations against him. Verse 5 says, they reward me evil for good. And that wraps around with where we hear his voice again after their voices. Verse 20, those who speak evil against my life. All the intervening verses are them speaking evil against him. What I'm saying is that these verses of curse are not first Jesus' words against his accusers, but they are first their words against him. Now, as such, considering that last week we looked at so many psalms which the wicked speak against, in which the wicked speak against the psalms, we, we heard like a few words here and there, you know, where is your God? Or this, the, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Or, or he says, aha, aha. You get just like a sentence or two. Here we get the longest statements from the wicked in one place anywhere in the Psalter. This is their longest airtime. And it is wicked. What are they saying? They're saying, or it is the wicked speaking. What are they saying? They are saying evil. That's how the psalmist describes it. But it actually raises a question because evil in the Hebrew can mean morally evil, and that's what we would call wicked. Um, these are wicked people who are saying it originally. Or evil can mean bad or catastrophe. Uh, that is not morally uh, right or wrong, but something that is, you know, wishing something would, bad would happen, not necessarily uh, uh, for a, a morally wrong reason. Now, even though the Hebrew can mean both of those things, if we hear these on the lips of the wicked, it is both, right, isn't it? They are wanting bad things to happen to him, and they're wanting that for, for bad reasons. They, they want uh, his wife a widow. They want his children fatherless. They want to blot out his family name. They want to cut off their, mem their memory from the earth of his whole family. Well, that is both bad events, but it is also a wicked desire if they're begging this on a righteous man. But is there a way that you could sing this or speak this or pray this if that person were truly wicked? Well, that, what's interesting about this long section, what I'm saying is the words of the wicked, verse 6 through 19, is that they are actually in the form of a prayer. Those speaking these curses are asking that God do these acts of judgment. After all, who can direct an accuser, a Satan, but God? Or who is sovereign over judicial process? They're asking for him to be found guilty. But God. They're asking that his lenders take back all that he, he, that he owes. That's a financial institution. God has sovereignty over all these realms of life. Over life and death. This one's call, these ones are calling on God. For it is God's to call sin to account. As he asks that his parents' sin be called to account. Which means, in terms of the pattern of what the wicked say in the Psalms from last week, these are the words of hypocrites. They, are, they have an awareness of God. And furthermore, they have an awareness of right and wrong. They're calling for punishments that could, in the right context, be just. Let him be found guilty. Let his creditors call in his debts. Let his father and mother be condemned. N not just be out of spite, but it could be for their own sins. What I'm saying is that these verses are not just curses any atheist could say. These are verses of someone who has knowledge of God's justice. To speak these kinds of curses, you'd have to be a Pharisee or a corrupt chief priest or a Saul of Tarsus or a Judas. And perhaps then that gives us the most amazing insight into those who are like that. This actually unveils the hearts of those who religiously oppose Jesus. Look closely at verses 16 to 19. These are those accusations spoken against the innocent sufferer. Those are accusations against Jesus. But how? 
I think this is to show that Judas, the religious leaders, intentionally misconstrued everything that Jesus did and said. Verse 16, he did not remember to show kindness, but pursued the poor and needy. Perhaps Judas focused on what he wanted to focus on. Jesus sometimes didn't do among his own people and in his own hometown what he did to others. And didn't Jesus say in Luke 4.25 that Elijah did not visit, visit any of the widows in Israel? And yet that's to look past how time and again Jesus did feed the hungry and many times was hungry himself. Jesus accounts himself in this psalm, verse 22, as poor and needy. The Son of Man had nowhere to lay down his head. <coughs> of course, Judas, in order to motivate himself to his deed, he had to twist the truth. Do you remember that incident when the perfume was poured on Jesus' feet? How Judas, Judas said it would have been better to be sold and given to the poor. Is Judas misconstruing things? Is Judas getting himself geared up so he can throw a curse on Jesus? Even though Judas himself is guilty, was he not the one pilfering from the purse secretly? What I'm saying is that these verses show how twisted hypocrisy becomes. Verse 17 accuses him, he, lo he loved to curse. Now perhaps Judas and those like him were remembering that Jesus did at times curse. Matthew 23, Jesus pronounced seven woes on the scribes and Pharisees because they were hypocrites, because they were pretending to be good, but inwardly were full of corruption. And when he called them out on it, they sought to put him to death. That is that those who want to pervert that and make Jesus out to be the aggressor are intentionally seeing things wrong. Friend, I, I feel like I need to say it this evening. Perhaps there's, there's, there, there, there's one, one who has come here this evening who's been wanting to find a reason why they don't have to believe in Jesus. And you're beginning to twist things in your heart and to, and to, to make out the things that Jesus said that there were hard sayings to make those to be his only sayings so that you don't have to listen to him anymore. I think this psalm is showing us Judas's heart. Dear ones, be, beware here, for this is, this is the voice of one who had, this, this, had Satan entered into him. Or verse 17b, he did not delight in blessing. How far off can you get if you're talking about Jesus? Unless, of course, you wanted to say that when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, he should have said, blessed are everybody, or blessed are the, those who are rich in the esteem of men. You know, those are the people who really should have the blessing, Jesus, not, not those, those other undeserving people. Or when Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that Jesus uh, should have said, blessed are those who are self-satisfied, like the Pharisees are. Instead of blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and instead say, Jesus, wouldn't it have been better if you'd said those who, blessed are those who abhor and disdain the cross? Because I would never go there, and I would never want to be a part of someone who did. I think this is showing us the line of thinking that got Judas to want to, call, want to get Jesus dead. This is why Judas wanted another to take his office. You get what that, that curse is saying of originally coming from his mouth or from the, 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 the chief priests and scribes. They're saying, we want a different Messiah than you. Dear ones, as sobering and as hard as these verses are, I want you to be reminded, do not forget that there are people who truly hate Jesus. And they hate him because he's good. They hate him because he shows forth what God is like, and they, they can't stand it. This, by the way, is the very thing that Jesus was talking about. And I know I'm getting ahead of Derek, who's preaching us through John, but this is in John 15, when Jesus quoted this psalm, speaking about himself. Paraphrase of what he's arguing there is that the world hated me first. They persecuted me. They're going to persecute you because they didn't know my father. They don't know God, even though they make a pretense of pretending to pray to him. And because I've done these signs and, and I've shown what the Father is like, their sin is all the worse because I came and they have rejected me. 
And so what is the psalmist's response to their accusations? Well, the psalmist also prays an imprecation. He also prays a curse. He asks for God's justice in verse 20. He says, may this be their reward. Verse 20, may this be the reward of my accusers from the Lord. Again, the pronouns are switched. This is the the, the innocent uh, psalmist who's speaking against his accusers now. May this be their reward of those who speak evil against my life. Or what's more clear, perhaps, is verse 29. May my accusers be clothed with dishonor. May they be wrapped in their own shame as in a cloak. This is how verse 8, which is obviously Judas's heart against Jesus in the original context of the psalm, following whose voice is speaking what, this is how that heart that was Judas against Jesus is rightly interpreted by the apostles to mean that another needed to take Judas's place. Because the innocent sufferer prayed that their own cursing would fall on them. The innocent sufferer does himself curse. Now, even as I say that, you may wonder, is that right of Jesus to ask? Well, let me give you several reasons why I believe it was perfectly right. Now, first, he is, even as the wicked were, he's he's calling on God to do this. The psalmist is not taking justice into his own hands. The wicked formed these curses as a prayer. They did so hypocritically. But the psalmist is praying rightly before God of his praise. Let this, verse 20, be their reward from the Lord. Verse 27, let them know that you, O Lord, have done this. This is something he he is is saying, I'm not going to be the avenger here. But Lord, you need to do this. And second, he's right to ask for this because this is the very pattern of God's own justice. I've given you several references in the outline. Psalm 7, Psalm 9, Psalm 57, Psalm 119, Proverbs 26, 27, Proverbs 28, 10, Ecclesiastes 10, 8. All of them say variations of the exact same truth, which is this. The wicked digs a pit and he falls in it himself. In this psalm, he curses like a madman. God's justice is that those very curses that came out of his lips will be the very ones by which he himself is judged and condemned. And by the way, if the psalmist here, indeed he has been yearning for God to speak, and if God is not answering his prayers, is this not how God does speak to his people at times? Not by an in-the-moment answering, in the moment of prayer, but by reminding us of his word, reminding us of these other portions, reminding us of this is my pattern of judgment, this I will do. Dear ones, God is not silent. And so even in our prayers to him, where he seems that he is silent, let us turn to his word. Let us remind ourselves of those things that he has said. He still says them. He is still true to them. See specifically how this takes place in this psalm. Verse 17, he loved to curse. Let curses come upon him. Well, that's what the wicked were asking of the righteous. And yet we, in this whole section, they're the ones who are actually cursing. They're the ones who clothe themselves with cursing. Verse 18, unto whom the curses should soak into, should wrap around. And so verse 29, they are to be clothed with dishonor and their own shame. This is just. And third, this is just because they are wrong. (laughs) Judas shows how wicked hypocrisy is, how when you get close to Jesus, you're either going to be changed and you're going to love Jesus or you're going to be warped and you're going to see everything perverted. Judas wanted Jesus removed from the office of Messiah. He wanted a different one who would come first in power. And that's, I think, why he's asking for all these curses uh, I want somebody who's going to tear down the wicked. Well, Jesus is going to do that, but not, he didn't in his first coming. And so Judas doesn't like this Jesus as he came first. He wants Jesus removed from office. 
And when he succeeds in that, he goes to his own place, a place where there is no repentance, a place of self-pity, where no other pity is to be offered, a place of hanging at his own hand. Truly a place of curse. But the fourth reason why Jesus is not wrong to pray as he does, even this prayer of curse, even this prayer of imprecation, is that Jesus truly is righteous. Jesus is right in everything that he said. Jesus is right in everything that he did. When he made a whip of cords and drove out the money changers, it was righteous. It was a holy zeal, and that's hard for us. And you know why that's hard for us? Because we're not righteous. We're not holy. We so often have our sin get in the way. And we know that it would be wrong if we were to, 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 to try to put ourselves in the place of the judge of all the earth because we're not the judge of all the earth. So these are reasons why I believe that Jesus was right to say these prayers. Even this cry for judgment upon the ones who are cursing him. And yet then why then do we sing them? Why is this given as a song to us? Well, one, I think this, this puts us, it's, it stresses us to see so much of who Jesus is and who is against him. And it drives us to that point where Judas was driven through. Either we're going to be changed and we're going to love this Jesus or we're going to join the cursor. We're going to invite Satan into our hearts and to turn everything that Jesus did into something that we hate. And we would ask that God himself would be against his Messiah, the only Messiah, Jesus Christ. And furthermore, I think we're invited to have these words on our lips because this is something that we are to grow into. You know, there's a, there is a place where people cry out for justice and vengeance and a place where you know that they're righteous. In the book of Revelation, in, in Revelation chapter 6, there are the souls of martyrs under the altar, and they're crying out day and night. How long, O Lord, before before you avenge our blood? That's not just Jesus, but that's Jesus' people who will be singing that. And by the way, they'll be answered, and they will praise God when he answers in the affirmative. That comes later in the book of Revelation. Friend, you and I, as hard as it may be be to believe right now, you and I will be made holy. You and I will be like Jesus, for we will see him as he is. It will not always be as it is now, where we are constantly confronted by our own sinfulness and we we don't know how to get past it. Friends, in a way, God is putting on us the words that we're not able to sing yet perfectly, but he wants us to be trained in these things because there will come a day when we will sing them. And you and I will be forever with the Lord. And we will love his beauty and his holiness such a way that everything that seems wrong and twisted, even in ourselves, will be swept away. We will always be with the Lord. And we will love righteousness. And we will love good. And we will hate wicked with a holy hatred. Forever and ever. To the glory of the God who is holy. To the glory of the God who is both now and evermore to be praised. Friends, I know these things are hard. But I want to see you to see how these drive you into the gospel. They drive you further to trust in Christ. They drive you to the promises that are yours in him. And yet let's move on. The psalmist does pray this imprecation. And there are two additional sections here which I'm only going to cover in summary. But I want you to see the glory of our Lord in these The first is, have mercy because of your love. In this section, the psalmist outlines his own suffering. 
He's poor and needy. He's grieved of heart. He's gone like a shadow. He's disposable as an insect. He's gaunt and weak. Friends, this is showing us our Lord. These are verses that Matthew takes to show us the scene at the cross. What I'm telling you is that the Psalms often give us more detail of what was going on as our Lord suffered for you and I than we have in the gospel accounts. Jesus looked like a man who had not eaten in some time because he's been fasting. And, he's, and fasting is associated with prayer. He's been praying. He's been praying for his enemies. Even as he prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them. Perhaps that, though, raises the question. I mentioned that there's going to be a time that we're going to be able to sing these. Is, is there... How do we navigate when is it appropriate to sing for God's justice, to, to cry for it? And I don't think this is easy. Uh, David, when he's fleeing Jerusalem, there's that son of Saul, or of the house of Saul, Shimei, who's throwing rocks at him. He's calling him a man of blood, throwing curses on him. And David says, I'm not going to take off his head, even though one of his mighty men said, I'll, I'll take off his head if you want. And David says, no. God has appointed him to curse me. Of course, later on in 1 Kings, David is giving instructions to Solomon. And he says, Solomon, there's this thing I want you to do. I want you to find Shimei and not let bring his gray, I want you to bring his gray hairs down to Sheol. What? <laughs> how do you get both out of David? <laughs> I think the similar question could be asked, how do you get both out of Jesus? How do you get Jesus who can pronounce woes on the scribes and Pharisees? Who on the very cross can say, Father, forgive them. Who even from heaven is going to, to judge justly. He's going to cast the wicked from his presence and say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Well, friends, these are hard. And I think it means we need to be prayerful in these things. We do need to be close to Jesus. The Psalms here give us that picture of Jesus at the crucifixion scene. He's famished. He's truly suffered. And his cry is, Lord, have mercy. God cares for the needy. The wicked does not care for the weedy, except as a pretense to help himself, to get a curse on another person. And yet, Jesus knows he can ask his father, because his father does care for the poor. His father does care for him on the cross. God cares for us, you and I, in our time of need, in the Lord Jesus. And God does so because he's faithful to himself. Verse 21, on behalf of your name's sake, because of your steadfast love. Friends, God who delivered Jesus from the betrayal of Judas, God who raised Jesus from the dead, is still this God. He has not changed. And so God, have mercy because of your love. And then lastly, I'll praise in the assembly. He says, with my mouth, I'll give great thanks to the Lord. I'll praise him in the midst of the throng. It's interesting how this theme has come up again and again, hasn't it? I, I mentioned it in connection with Psalm 22, Psalm 69. Uh, Psalm 40 has this in well. These songs which begin with such intense suffering and sorrow, they return to this theme of desiring to be in the assembly, even as I do believe our voices will be with Jesus's. And he longed for that. He longed for that as he hung on the cross. And indeed, he's delighting in that as we are brought one by one into the kingdom. And one by one, we go to be with him in heaven. And so the sufferer has, uh, he, he wants to be in the assembly. Uh, so he also wants to be this one who will have God give his justice. My friends, there's much more to be said about this psalm. I know these things are hard. They stretch us. Friends, do you love God's justice as Jesus did? Do you see yourself as a sinner in need of mercy? Well, friends, Jesus does show mercy. He did come in his first coming to show mercy. And yet, dear ones, be warned. Because as we see both, both his, his love for his enemies and his, his calling for God to, to curse them in this psalm, so it is true that this same Jesus who has come first to save from sin, 
He will come again to judge. And so now is the time to repent and believe. Now is the time to receive this mercy. Now is the time to know this God through his son, Jesus Christ. Now is the time to be forgiven. Repent of where your heart has been the wicked one, calling for, uh, for, for wickedness upon your enemies as a v- personal vengeance against God's justice or maybe as a perversion of God's justice, as a hypocrite. Repent of these things and find mercy. But know that that mercy will only be held forth to you so long. For this same one will, and I, Lord, I pray it would not be toward you, but he will say of those who will not repent, may it be that their curses would be turned upon them. That God's justice, God who is judge of all the earth, would truly be known as such. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we we, we we see the wickedness of, of the heart of man. Father, forgive us where we have looked anything like this wickedness, played the hypocrite ourselves. You are holy. And yet, Lord, we thank you that Jesus came first as a friend to those who hated him. And Lord, Saul of Tarsus, who breathed out threats of lies and murder, became Paul. And Lord, we have known your mercy. May we be those who do justly and love mercy. Lord, teach us how to revere you and to love you, Lord Jesus. Even the dynamics of of your, your, your love for your enemies, but also that you will come in justice. That now is the window of grace. So Lord, would you save all your elect. And Lord, when the time comes, Would you make the the pit of those who have dug it be the very pit in which they fall, who would not repent, who hated you, Lord Jesus, and hated your mercy and grace. But Lord, even yet, we would pray for them. Even yet, Lord, we would pray that you would save all your elect, change them from enemies to being your precious sons and daughters. We do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.